That's the hope, the promise that God has given to us that the dead in Christ shall rise one day. And we're looking forward to that day, whether it be uh, death, that's the hope we have. It says in the book of First Thessalonians, we sorrow not as do others who have no hope. And we have the hope of the resurrection that one day we shall rise. Or when the Lord Jesus Christ comes, which we would prefer, I suppose, to all of us go up together. Till then. Let us serve him when, let that hope, like it said of him, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despised the shame, but now is set down at the right hand of the Father on high. And so for the joy that is set before us, that one day we shall rise, you can have that blessed hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. We welcome those of you who have joined us on YouTube, and we trust God's blessing on you. We wish you a very blessed and happy Easter. We have for us to preach this morning, Brother Terence Jones, he's the associate pastor of the Oasis Church in Orlando, uh, Florida, and he's here with us for the weekend. He was a member of our church years ago, and um, then went on to other ministries. And we're glad to have him to come this morning, and he will share a message, uh, as you will see, Try to get your attention there, and please don't get stumped. But with God, as you will find out, 
God bless you, brother. All right, thank you. Thank you. Okay, well, good morning to, to everyone. Good to see all of you. And let me wish you all a very merry... I said Merry Easter. <laughs> I don't know where that came from, but a very blessed and happy Easter. It is good to be back home again. And being at Paddock Road, that is considered home for me as well. I want to thank all of you for, for your prayers. It's been, I guess, almost a year, just about a year, since I was here last. Last time I was here, it wasn't a, it wasn't a very pleasant trip, but, um, you know, thank God for the way that he heals us, at least, well, he attempts to, and uh, we tend to fight that healing sometimes. But I just want to thank all of you for your prayers, and I just wanted to let you all know that the last year of my life uh, has made up for the 10 years of struggle that I had prior to that. Now, there are some new faces in here, so you don't know my story, and I'm not planning on telling it this morning. I got some other things to say. But for those of you who do know my story, you know what the struggle had been for me when I left the ministry back in 2013. But God in His grace, after 10 years in the wilderness, God in His grace opened a door for me to return to the ministry again at Oasis Church. And how many of you have ever read that passage in Joel chapter 2? When God said to Israel that I will give you back the years that the locusts have eaten. Yeah. I know what that verse means now. I know what that verse means now that God can give us back years. It means that God can give us back opportunities in life that make up for the opportunities that we missed over 10 years. He can give us those back in a year. That's what he did for me. And I know it's because that you were here and you all were praying for me over these years, supporting me, encouraging me. Uh, when I did not have the faith to believe in myself, the opportunities I had to come and minister here at Paddock Road and uh, just all that the Lord put in my life over those, those times of doubt and uh, frustration and anger and disappointment yet uh, just kept me on the right path that when the time came, eh, not that I think I'm Jesus or anything, but in the fullness of time, God gave me the opportunity to return to ministry. And uh, it has been a wonderful experience to be back in the Word, to be ministering to people and to just engage in what I know is my calling. You know, there's some things that you can just do in life because you have to. But when you get to do the things that you want to do because you love it, oh boy, that's a special blessing right there. But now, I want to encourage you this morning, this Easter Sunday, that you're here and uh, you're hoping to hear something from the Lord. I want to share with you a message this morning that I'm, I'm going to call Stumped by the Impossible. We're going to be in the Gospel of Mark chapter 16 this morning. Before we get started, let's have a quick word of prayer and just answer the Lord's blessing on our, on our time together. Our Father, we thank you for the wonderful celebration that is today, and that is Easter. We want to thank you, Lord, that you sent your son as a babe, but he did not remain that way. But he matured to be the sacrifice for our sins. He was crucified, he was buried, but then he rose again. And that resurrection confirmed for us the hope that we are celebrating today, and that is the hope of our salvation. 
It is by his resurrection that we have been justified. And so we thank you for what he did for us and what it means for us as we have accepted that in our lives. Father, bless your word as it goes forth that it would minister grace to those who hear. And may we be strengthened, Lord, in the things that you have called us to do in Jesus' name. Amen. Stumped by the impossible. Uh, Easter is a time of celebration uh, for, for most Christians. Where I minister, Easter is bigger than Christmas, if you can believe it. Yeah, it because Christmas, you've got to share Christmas with everybody. But, but when it comes to Easter, Easter is just about Christians. That, that is, that's our holiday. That's our celebration. Focusing on what Jesus Christ did in suffering on the cross and then being raised again on the third day. And so we kind of use that as an opportunity to promote and to evangelize because we keep that to ourselves. And it's a big thing. You're here today, some of you, because it's Easter Sunday. You probably, if it wasn't Easter, you probably won't be here. But Easter is special. It's a celebration today for us. But it was not a celebration for those first generation saints. You see, for those disciples who had to endure seeing Jesus on the cross, that wasn't a time of clapping your hands and let's praise and worship God. And certainly to know that he is in a tomb, that could not have been a, a fun time for them. And so far from being celebratory at Easter, for them, it was a time of doubt. You know, if you just read the, the resurrection accounts in any of the Gospels, we sense this idea about the disciples, and it is this, is that they are now questioning their faith. They are now questioning whether it was right to believe in Jesus at all because they could not process how Jesus could die. After all that he said he was, after all that they saw him do, it did not make sense to them. How could this man die and we have just invested our entire lives in him? You see, when you, when you deal in death, as we understand today, all right, death is not something that you come back from. Once folk die, that's it. Anything that you had to say be, before that, you can't say it now. Anything that you had to do, you can't do it now. Because death is the great separator. Nobody comes back from that. Well, now you say to yourself, well, you know, but, uh, but there was Lazarus. And, and the disciples, they, they saw Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead. And Lazarus, he was in the tomb. And the only problem with that is that Jesus was on the outside of the tomb, and Jesus was the one calling him out. But now we got Jesus in the tomb, and there ain't no other Jesus to be calling him out. So what are we going to do now? So, so we see them face an impossible situation because for them, death is impossible. You don't come back from death. And so they look at their faith compared to the death of their Savior and they see that as an impossible situation and they are stumped. All right? You see, just like we get stumped today, by impossible situations in our life. Yeah. Yeah, come on now. You see, we get into situations today. We can look back on those disciples and we can say, oh, you know, Jesus taught them so long. How, how couldn't they have known? Uh, Jesus said this and Jesus taught that. And they, they should have known better. As if we would have known better if we were there. God can't get through to us now 
and we had 2,000 years of Christian doctrine and theology, and God still got a problem with us. Also, think about those brothers back then, seeing this for the first time, trying to understand it for the first time. You better believe it was a struggle. Just like how you struggle today when you get into circumstances that you didn't expect, you didn't ask for. In fact, you hope things will be different in your life, but they're not turning out that way, are they? In fact, no matter how much you try, no matter how much you pray, no matter how much you read the word, no matter how much you say you can trust God, come to church, give your money, do whatever you think it is to get God on your side, stuff still not working out for you. You all don't know what I'm talking about here this morning. You all don't know about this kind of stuff. Yeah, you all accustomed to living the easy life. Everything you pray for comes true. Your life is easy. Oh, but they got some folk, man, that they go through some rough times. They got some folk, man, that they, they, they face some challenges. And I'm not talking about, you know, my cell phone screen broke, therefore I can't get the apps that I want. I'm not talking about that kind of stuff, man. I'm talking about stuff that keeps you up at night. I'm talking about the stuff that when you look at a plate of food, you can't eat it. The stuff that makes you sleep light, you know, that every little noise wakes you up because you've got things on your mind. Yeah, we get stumped by the impossible all the time. Just like those brothers back then. I want to give this key thought to you, and I want you to keep this in your mind as we go throughout this message. And the thought is this, to embrace God's interventions in our lives, we must be willing to believe that anything is possible. Now, nah, that's that going to sound like a tall order. But let's look at the word together, and let's see how this situation unfolds in, and what God has for us at the very end. So let's start in verse 1. We are in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 16. Verse 1. And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, had bought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. This is Jesus in the tomb. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulcher at the rising of the sun. And they said among themselves, Who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? Now here we see these three women. They have no doubt in their mind that Jesus is dead. They're not expecting no resurrection. They're on their way to the tomb with spices because they want to embalm the body of Jesus. All right? And that embalming was the same thing, not as technical as we have it today, not as advanced as we have it, but that was their way of preserving the body from putrefaction. All right? Just like how we make somebody look good for a viewing, all right, at a funeral. You know, we, 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 we do that. I'm not sure you, you think about it that way. But you know that we want, we want their body to look dignified in death. Because we want to honor the memory, their memory in life. That's why we make them look the way that they do. We want them to have some dignity in death. Because of what they meant to us in life. And that is what these women are doing. They want to bring these spices there and they want to anoint the body of Jesus. They want it, they want it to be preserved for as long as it possibly can. Because, because they want Jesus to be, to be dignified even in death. That is how much he meant to them. So they, they know he's dead. They know he's dead. They're not expecting him to come back. Now verse 4 and 5. And when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. And entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment, and they were affrighted. Now, this is an old English word. I'm using this translation intentionally. That word, affrighted, it might sound like fear, but it, it's more than fear. 
Uh, the word, the word is something is like when, if it is possible for fear to actually amaze you. It's like something happens and it is so incredible that you can't wrap your brain around how could this thing be happening like you, you ain't got enough connections in your, in, your, in your brain itself to figure this out. But it is not amazement in a good way. It is an amazement that terrifies you because you can't process it. This is how traumatic the experience is for these women. It is not just the fact that Jesus is dead, but now they get confronted by this reality of a man standing in the tomb and the, the stone being rolled away. Now verse 6, And he said unto them, Be not affrighted. Ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. But go your way, tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him as he said unto you. And they went out quickly and fled from the sepulcher, for they trembled and were amazed, neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. So, so, so this, is, this is not an easy experience for these women. So, so the angel, right, he's just not standing up there and just looking at them. He stands up there and he gives them this message. He knows why they're there. Nobody has to tell him anything. He knows that they're there. And he tells them, you need to investigate where the body was. It's not just enough for me to tell you. You have to come and look. You have to come and see. Test what it is that I'm telling you to realize that this thing is true. See, a, a second-hand gospel can only go so far, right? Folk pa passing down stuff. Eventually, somebody going to have to verify it that is actually true. And so the angel said, come and check this thing out. And then he tells them, once you prove this, don't keep it to yourself. You have to go and tell other people. Go tell the disciples, and then you have to tell Peter. And Peter is highlighted there because of what Peter did. He was the only one that we know that verbally, publicly denied Jesus. And so there is, it's, it's safe to assume that, that he probably separated himself from everyone else. But there's special mention given to him because he needs to be brought back on board. So tell the disciples, and if any of you got a problem with Peter, you better tell him too. Because he not left out. And these women, when they hear this, they run out of the tomb. Have you ever seen, have you ever seen this? Like in a movie, a horror movie or something like that, that you see the, the, the camera shot is people walking into a building and the camera stays on the outside and they walk in as a couple of seconds and then you hear a growl or a gunshot or something like that and then you just see the people shooting out, running, scampering, like on their all fours and then, stand up, and then just, they just run right out. That's these women right here. These women didn't stroll out of the tomb. They didn't sashay out talking. These women hitting all fours, running out all cylinders. Turbos on, these people are running. And you know folks scared, right? You know, you know people scared? When they don't say nothing to nobody and they don't look at nobody. And this is what, this is what they say. They didn't say nothing to anybody. They just kept their head down and they're running. That's fear. That is how traumatic this event is for them. People in, you're raising their hand and singing praise, Jesus, he's back, hitting tambourines and all kinds of stuff. This is, this is something that they can't process. Let's look at verse 9. Now when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. And she went and told them that had been with him as they mourned and wept. And they, when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, you see these next two words? Believed not. Nobody's going to believe this. Nobody's going to believe this. 
You see, now you would think that Mary got some credibility. Yeah. She was the one that was demon-possessed. Jesus did a work in her life. She's with Jesus. You would think that folk would say, well, if anybody's going to be telling the truth about Jesus, it's going to be her. No, they didn't, they didn't believe that. They did not believe. And in verse 10, this reference here, that those who had been with him as they mourned and wept, nobody is expecting Jesus to come back from the dead. That's why people mourning and that's why they're weeping. Nobody's holding a vigil by the tomb because they're waiting for him to come out. They have resigned themselves to the fact that Jesus is dead and he is not coming back. To the degree that when somebody does show up and somebody who you would think has credibility says, Jesus is back from the dead. Nobody believes it. Verse 12. After that, he appeared in another form unto two of them as they walked and went into the country. This would be the two disciples on the road to Emmaus in the Gospel of Luke. And it says, and they went and told it unto the residue, that is those who are left, neither believed they them. Nobody believes. Nobody believes that Jesus came back from the dead. Their life is in shambles, okay? Their life is in shambles. And two people, well, three, come to them and tell them, the solution is right here. Jesus has come back. Our lives, they are in shambles because we believe Jesus is dead. But these individuals come to them and tell them, we have the solution. Jesus is no longer dead. He is back. So our lives can get back to normal. And they cannot believe it. They cannot believe the solution even when it is handed to them. Because the solution is impossible. It is an impossible solution. No one comes back from the dead. So even though this is going to fix my problem, it's impossible. I can't believe it. I want to give you all a challenge here this morning. And I want to challenge you with this. What is it in your life that you cannot believe God for? What is it in your life that you cannot believe God for? You see, there, there's some things that have happened to us. For some of you, there are certain things that are happening right now that have you stuck. See? In fact, you've been stuck not for days or weeks or months. You've been stuck for years. And you are in the situation that you're in, not because you don't believe in God, right? Because you believe in God. You're here this morning, ain't you? You probably come many other times. You are stuck because you believe that your problem can't be fixed. Then, or maybe you might even go so far as to believe that your problem shouldn't be fixed. Let me tell you two ways that, that we have a tendency to get stuck. All right. We believe that complex and prolonged difficulties are inevitable and unchangeable. Yeah, let, me, let me say that again, because some of you were sleeping 
when I get here. We believe complex and prolonged difficulties are inevitable and unchangeable. We adapt very quickly to situations in our life in order to survive. What it is we believe we got to survive because people are dependent upon us and we can't let them down. Or we are dependent upon other people and we need them in our lives or certain situations or activities. And we believe that we need this for whatever reason. And so we adapt to situations and to people and relationships that are not healthy, that are detrimental. Because it has gone on for so long. And when things go on for a little while in our lives, yeah, we don't got a problem trusting God, praying, yeah, God, that you help me through this. But when stuff starts sticking around for a little longer than we plan, well, we start to lose hope fast. And when hope goes, we just make up our mind, this is what we're going to live with. Now, we know that when it comes to the word that the Bible you know that there is virtue in suffering, okay? I'm not going to deny that, but let me tell you what there is no virtue in. There is no virtue in unnecessary suffering. There ain't no virtue in that. So if you dig a hole of your own devices and crawl in there and then bury yourself, there's no virtue in that. But because the thing had gone on for so long, because it was so complex that you couldn't figure it out. Many of you have chosen to live with the person in your life. You have chosen to live with the situation in your life. You have chosen to agree to the environment in your life because of the complexity and because of the longevity of it. And you resign yourself to that fact. Oh, you, you guys don't know about that, do you? Y'all don't know about that. Here's the second thing that gets us stuck. We believe the opportunities and resources available to us are never enough. We believe the opportunities and resources available to us are never enough. So when we look at the situation, and when we look at who we are, the situation always is greater than us. And we say, I don't have what it takes to get over this. We look at it and we say, I, I just don't have the resources. I don't have the emotional, mental, physical capacities to really process this and to get through it and to overcome it. And so I... I resign myself to, to living with this. You know, you, and then we start to think, you know, that we, that we deserve this. You know? We start thinking, man, that when this stuff don't go away, that this, we really, we really, we did something that brought this on us. That's the reason why we got to carry this burden. It's our fault. It's our fault. And so, and so we, every morning that, that 500 pound burden is right where we left it at the foot of our bed. And we, we pick it up every day and we stack it on our backs and we walk with it and we live with it. Because it is impossible. It is impossible to get rid of it. Listen, you, you, you all know what I'm talking, you all get a sense of what I'm talking about. If it's not in your life, you probably know somebody then. You know somebody who, who has to deal with that. My thought to you at the very beginning, okay, is about God's intervention, all right? And it was this, is that to embrace God's interventions in your life, okay, you must be willing to believe. You have to be willing to believe that anything is possible. Have you ever heard somebody give a testimony that was so 
incredible that it appeared outrageous. Have you ever, have you heard, have you ever heard a testimony like that? I have heard some testimonies in my time. I heard this testimony one time about a lady. She rear-ended another car on the highway, not in Barbados. And she got out of the car. She was, she was so upset. It was her fault. And when she got out of the car, she went and she looked. There was no damage to the, to the other car. And she was so relieved, not a scratch on it. But then when she turned and looked at her car, headlights broken out, bonnet bent back, bumper falling off, lights shattered, and she, she just could not believe it. And she just looked at that car. That was the only car she needed transportation. And she, and she said, God, I need for you to heal my car. God, I need for you to heal my car. And she said, just right before her, just right before her, the lights started to come back together. The bumper started to straighten out. The hood just bent back in. God healed her car right in front of her eyes. Let me tell you something. I didn't believe that for one second. You understand? I know this woman. She could see, people could, listen, people could see whatever they want. All right? But, but let me tell you this, even if, you, you probably heard things like that before, not with a God healing a car, but God doing something that you, you said, man, this, this, is, this, this is outrageous. How could people do this kind of thing? Well, let me say this. If, even if, the person were to give you enough evidence that you could believe that something like that did happen, you are not going to believe that it could happen to you. Isn't that true? Those big testimonies that you hear, those are one-time deals, you understand? They don't come around. That's like winning the lottery. That don't happen to every Christian. That stuff happens to somebody in India, give you a year testimony. That, that, that ain't coming around to Barbados. Then that stuff don't come around to Barbados. Barbados, some small miracles happen down here. None, none big like that. If God can be dishing that stuff out, he kind of sprinkles that all around the world. And we have this tendency to believe, right, that big things ain't going to happen to us. And so we don't believe God for them. God can raise a man from the dead so that he could change the world. Okay? I think God can do a little something for you. You see, because the God that is right here in Mark chapter 16, making all of this stuff possible, is the same God that saved me from my sins. All right? And he's the same God that wants to be at work in your life. Now let me tell you, the only person stopping that God from doing something significant in your life is not the people who doubt you. It is not the people who complain about you. It is not the people who don't like you. The only person that can stop God in your life is you. And what it comes down to is this. What are you willing to believe God for? That is what it comes down to. Now, if you are the type of person that you cannot believe that God can do the impossible, well, then you have to Resign yourself to live with certain things happening in your life. Just remember this. There is no virtue in unnecessary suffering. I don't care who tells you that there is. There's none. There's only bitterness and anger and frustration waiting for you because the suffering was not meant for you. And when you start bringing things into your life that were not meant for you, you are no longer you. That's why you're miserable. That's why you're angry. That's why you're always frustrated with the world. You want to see God move in your life, then you have to be willing to see beyond what you've been looking at for so long, and that is you've been trusting God for what you think is possible.
You've been trusting God for what you think is possible. You have not been willing to think about the impossible. I once had this man tell me, he was a, he was a colonel in the, uh, in the Marines. I don't know if this is original with him, but when he told it to me, I always remembered it. He told me this. You have to be willing to think big enough so that you give yourself options. And we have to start thinking bigger about God. You and I, we got some big stuff happening in our lives that been weighing us down for years. It's time that we start looking at God as a God of the impossible. Because we've been thinking about what is possible for so long and we're still in the situations that we're in. Maybe we got to start thinking a little bigger now so that we start giving ourselves some options. What if you did not have to deal in the realm of possibility? What if you could think about God, that God could do what is impossible? Do you think that would change how you approach your circumstances? If you had a God that could break through what was possible and get into impossibilities? Oh, these disciples, they, they couldn't see it. They could not see it. Jesus had to show up and tell them, it's me. They can wrap their minds around the fact, how could God bring a man back from the dead? That's impossible. Man, listen, that was breakfast for God, man. God does deals in their possibility before 6 o'clock in the morning. God done do 10 impossible things. And that's what you need to do in your life. That's what you need to do in your life. The burden that brought you to this church this morning, right? It's time for you to start thinking impossible about that. God impossible about that. The situation that you're not looking forward to when you get home or that you got to deal with this week at work, at school, wherever you are. You've been dealing with it for months, years. Oh, we got to give that over now to the God who deals with the impossible. Get out of what is possible. Let's start thinking about what is impossible now. So I'm going to ask you to bow your heads. And I want you to just focus on a couple of thoughts here this morning. I'm going to leave with you. I don't know your situation. I don't know what it is that been a challenge for you over this weekend. I don't know where you've been struggling over the last few months of your life. Maybe you thought 2024 was going to be your year of transformation. And all it has been is a year of frustration. And you look at your circumstances and you, you look at the people in your life and you say, I ain't going nowhere. I'm back here again. Stuck. I don't see the solution. Everything I got planned in my life, everything I think can work, don't work. Listen, let's, let's, get out, let's get out of that. Let's get out of that and let's ask God to open our minds this morning. Ask God to open your mind this morning that you start giving yourself some options. That you let God get creative in your life. And start getting ready to prepare you for something miraculous happening. Something that is just going to blow your mind. You can't wrap your mind around it. That when it happened, your first thought is going to be, I can't believe it. But then you're going to remember, oh, I heard something about God doing the impossible. And you're going to see just how good God is in your life. And if you have never made a decision to follow God through his son, Jesus Christ, and let me tell you something, that's the best decision you can make on Easter. Because as long as you're living outside of him, you're always going to be in the possible. 
But the moment that you allow Christ into your life, oh, then we can start talking about things changing. And you getting into the realm of doing things and experiencing things that are unlike anything that you have happened before in your life. But you have to let God do what he needs to do in your life. Let him be God. Don't harness him. Don't constrain him. Don't enslave him with your small way of thinking. See him for, for who he is, and that is God. The one who could raise Christ from the dead and change the world. That's what it can be for you. So if you've never made that decision to allow Christ into your life, then that's where we need to start. Well, for all others, who you've been carrying in that burden, and you haven't been able to figure out what to do because you've been thinking so much with your own experience, with your own knowledge, talking to the people who around you, telling you what you should do and nothing ain't working, it's time for you to release that into the realm of what is impossible. And that's God's speciality right there. And so you could give that over to God right now and you say, God, I am tired of the possible in my life. I need the impossible. I need for you to open my mind right now, Lord. That I no longer believe what I can see, what I can hear, but I start believing you. And I let you do you. Because I don't want to carry this burden no more. I'm tired of this weight. I'm tired of these tears. I'm tired of complaining. I'm tired of being angry all the time. God, would you do something? Would you do the impossible for me? Our Father in heaven, we just want to thank you. We want to thank you. And you are a God that you are not bound by our limitations. Sometimes we think that we're so smart. Because we read the Bible. Because we, we know where certain verses are. Because we can explain some of your actions to people. We think that we have a handle on you. And then we get thrown into situations that don't make sense in our life and we realize, oh, what I know ain't getting me nowhere. Uh, sometimes we get frustrated and we turn our backs and we want to walk away. But I pray that you would give us a renewed understanding today. That just because we don't understand something that don't mean that you ain't God no more. It just means that we need to understand more about you. Men, that we reached our limits and now we've got to be willing to step out to learn more. So I pray that you would just open our minds. Your people who are gathered here this morning, uh, they've been looking at situations and they've been, they've been doubting you, God. They've been doubting you and they've been wondering if you even real. Because they look at their circumstances and and they say, ain't nothing changing. I'm believing what it is that I know to believe and nothing ain't happening. Oh God, I pray that you would open their minds and let them see, well, you just ain't believing enough. It's time for you to believe even more. And so I pray that you would give them the courage to step out. To step out into the unknown. That area where they have never walked before. Where they had never meditated on before. I pray you will usher them in to a new environment, a new vista of you that they never could conceive before because they were locked in by what is possible. Give us supernatural thoughts right now, Lord, that we can embrace a supernatural God who wants to do some supernatural things in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Brother Terence Jones, for the uh, message this morning. And as he was preaching there, I was thinking that one person was coming to my mind. 
I know that she would have start. She would have gone on the piano and started to play the chorus. Nothing is impossible with God. That sister thought that was one of her favorites. And just want to read the chorus. Nothing is impossible when you put your trust in God. Nothing is impossible when you are trusting in His Word. Hearken to the voice of God to thee. Is there anything too hard to me? Then put your trust in God alone and rest upon His Word for everything or oh, everything. Yes, everything is possible with God. Dear friend, that's the message of Easter story of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. What God did there, the Bible indicates in the book of Ephesians, of him raising Jesus Christ from the dead, then there's nothing uh, that we cannot do. I mean, we know that before, but he can deal with your problems. He can solve them for you. He can bring you to that place. But as he said, you need to let him do that. Don't dig a hole for yourself and feel sorry for yourself. Cry one unto him if you're down in the miry clay, down in the horrible pit. And the Bible says, as David gave in his testimony, that God answered him and he put his, foot upon, his feet upon a rock. And you need stabilizing first. And then afterwards he says, he put his, my feet upon a rock and he established my goings. So he'll help you to move on. And then afterwards he says, I put a song in my mouth, even praises unto our God. Yes, praise God that today the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ tells us that whatever it is, God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. If you're not saved, then Jesus Christ is the answer. And it tells us that clearly in the Bible concerning the resurrection of the Lord and that through his resurrection, there's justification. God would declare us righteous and make us his. If you're here without the Lord Jesus, or you're listening to us and you don't have the Lord Jesus as your savior, we like to encourage you to put your trust in him. If you'd like to know more how you can do that, please contact us. It has nothing to do with church or any creeds or any organization. It has to do with the Lord Jesus Christ. And we like to point you to that knowledge of the Lord Jesus. So please contact us somehow and we'd be glad to help you. Those of us who are saved, let us stand and sing, I serve a risen Savior. For closing. I serve a risen Savior. He lives, he lives. And you sing that knowing that testimony that God has given to you. I serve a risen Savior, He's in the world today. I know that He is living, whatever man may say, I see His hand of mercy, I hear His voice in prayer, and
Thank you, Brother Terence, for the message and the reminder about God, uh, what he can do for us, and the fact that that guarantees our own resurrection if we die. And you need to know the Lord Jesus as your Savior. We're glad to have those who